Part One, Section Three of the Life of King Alfred. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of King Alfred by Asser, Bishop of Sherborne. Translated by J. A. Giles. Part One. Section 3. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation, 874, the twenty-sixth since the birth of King Alfred, the army, before so often mentioned, left Lindsay and marched to Mercia, where they wintered at Repton. Also they compelled Burred, King of Mercia, against his will, to leave his kingdom and go beyond the sea to Rome, in the twenty-second year of his reign. He did not long live after his arrival, but died there, and was honorably buried in the school of the Saxons, in St. Mary's Church, where he awaits the Lord's coming and the first resurrection with the just. The pagans also, after his expulsion, subjected the whole kingdom of the Mercians to their dominion but by a most miserable arrangement gave it into the custody of a certain foolish man named Caelwulf, one of the king's ministers, on condition that he should restore it to them whenever they should wish to have it again. And to guarantee this agreement, he gave them hostages, and swore that he would not oppose their will, but be obedient to them in every respect." In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 875, which was the twenty-seventh of King Alfred, the above-named army, leaving Repton, divided into two bodies, one of which went with Halfdana into Northumbria, and having wintered there near the Tyne, reduced all Northumberland to subjection. They also ravaged the Picts and the Strathclydensians. Note. Stratclyde Britons. End of note. The other division, with Gothron, Oscitel, and Anwiund, three kings of the pagans, went to a place called Grantabridge, and there wintered. Note. Cambridge. End of note. In the same year, King Alfred fought a battle by sea against six ships of the pagans, and took one of them. The rest escaped by flight. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation, 876, being the twenty-eighth year of King Alfred's life, the aforesaid army of the pagans, leaving Grant a bridge by night, entered a castle called Wareham, where there is a monasterium of holy virgins between the two rivers Fraum and Trent, in the district which is called in British Durngurs, but in Saxon, Thornsatta, placed in a most secure situation, except that it was exposed to danger on the western side from the nature of the ground. With this army, Alfred made a solemn treaty, to the effect that they should depart out of the kingdom, and for this they made no hesitation to give as many hostages as he named. Also, they swore an oath over the Christian relics, which with King Alfred were next in veneration after the deity himself, that they would depart speedily from the kingdom. Note. They swore oaths to Alfred on the holy ring, says the Saxon chronicle. The most solemn manner of swearing among the Danes and other northern nations was by their arms. Olaus Magnus, Book 8, Section 2. End of note. But they again practiced their usual treachery, and caring nothing for the hostages or their oaths, they broke the treaty, and sallying forth by night, slew all the horsemen that the king had round him, and, turning off into Devon to another place called in Saxon Exochester, but in British Carewise, which means in Latin the city of the Ex, Situated on the eastern bank of the river Wise, they directed their course suddenly toward the South Sea, which divides Britain and Gaul, and there passed the winter. 
In the same year, Halfdana, king of those parts, divided out the whole country of Northumberland between himself and his men, and settled there with his army. In the same year, Rollo, with his followers, penetrated into Normandy. This same Rollo, Duke of the Normans, whilst wintering in Old Britain, or England, at the head of his troops, enjoyed one night a vision, revealing to him the future. See more of this Rollo in the Annals. Note. It is necessary to inform the reader that many passages of this work are modern interpolations, made in the old manuscript by a later hand. The annals referred to in the text are supposed not to be a genuine work of Asser. End of note. In the year 877, the pagans, on the approach of autumn, partly settled in Exeter and partly marched for plunder into Mercia. The number of that disorderly crew increased every day, so that, if thirty thousand of them were slain in one battle, others took their places to double the number. Then King Alfred commanded boats and galleys, that is, long ships, to be built throughout the kingdom, in order to offer battle by sea to the enemy as they were coming. On board of these he placed seamen, and appointed them to watch the seas. Meanwhile he went himself to Exeter, where the pagans were, wintering, and, having shut them up within the walls, laid siege to the town. He also gave orders to his sailors to prevent them from obtaining any supplies by sea, and his sailors were encountered by a fleet of a hundred and twenty ships full of armed soldiers, who were come to help their countrymen. As soon as the king's men knew that they were fitted with pagan soldiers, they leaped to their arms and bravely attacked those barbaric tribes. But the pagans, who had now for almost a month been tossed and almost wrecked among the waves of the sea, fought vainly against them. Their bands were discomfited in a moment, and all were sunk and drowned in the sea, at a place called Sowanawick. Note. Swanwich in Dorsetshire. End of note. In the same year, the army of pagans, leaving Wareham, partly on horseback and partly by water, arrived at Swanwick, where one hundred and twenty of their ships were lost, and King Alfred pursued their land army as far as Exeter. There he made a covenant with them, and took hostages that they would depart. Note. This is a mere repetition of the preceding. See a former note in this page. End of note. The same year, in the month of August, that army went into Mercia and gave part of that country to one Calewolf, a weak-minded man, and one of the king's ministers. The other part they divided among themselves. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation, 878, which was the thirtieth of King Alfred's life, the army above mentioned left Exeter and went to Chippenham, a royal villa, situated in the west of Wiltshire, and on the eastern bank of the river, which is called in British the Avon. There they wintered, and drove many of the inhabitants of that country beyond the sea, by the force of their arms, and by want of the necessaries of life. They reduced almost entirely to subjection all the people of that country. At the same time, the above-named Alfred, king of the West Saxons, with a few of his nobles and certain soldiers and vassals, used to lead an unquiet life among the woodlands of the country of Somerset, in great tribulation. For he had none of the necessaries of life except what he could forage openly or stealthily, by frequent sallies from the pagans, or even from the Christians, who had submitted to the rule of the pagans, and, as we read in the life of St. Naot, at the house of one of his cowherds. Note. The Woodlands. Athelney, a morass formed by the conflux of the Thone and Parrot. End of note. But it happened on a certain day, that the countrywoman, wife of the cowherd, was preparing some loaves to bake, 
and the king, sitting at the hearth, made ready his bow and arrows and other warlike instruments. The unlucky woman, espying the cakes burning at the fire, ran up to remove them, and rebuking the brave king, exclaimed, Can thee mind the cakes, man, and doesn't see em burn? I'm bound these eat em fast enough as soon as tis the turn. Note. The original here is in Latin verse, and may therefore be rendered into English verse, but such as every housewife in Somersetshire would understand. End of note. The blundering woman little thought that it was King Alfred who had fought so many battles against the pagans, and gained so many victories over them. But the Almighty not only granted to the same glorious king victories over his enemies, but also permitted him to be harassed by them, to be sunk down by adversities, and depressed by the low estate of his followers, to the end that he might learn that there is one Lord of all things, to whom every knee doth bow, and in whose hand are the hearts of kings, who puts down the mighty from their seat, and exalteth the humble, who suffers his servants, when they are elevated at the summit of prosperity, to be touched by the rod of adversity, that in their humility they may not despair of God's mercy, and in their prosperity they may not boast of their honors, but may also know to whom they owe all the things which they possess. We may believe that the calamity was brought upon the king aforesaid, because in the beginning of his reign, when he was a youth and influenced by youthful feelings, he would not listen to the petitions which his subjects made to him for help in their necessities, or for relief from those who oppressed them. But he repulsed them from him, and paid no heed to their requests. This particular gave much annoyance to the holy man St. Naot, who was his relation, and often foretold to him in the spirit of prophecy that he would suffer great adversity on this account. But Alfred neither attended to the reproof of the man of God, nor listened to his true prediction. Wherefore, seeing that a man's sins must be corrected, either in this world or the next, the true and righteous judge was willing that his sin should not go unpunished in this world, to the end that he might spare him in the world to come. From this cause, therefore, the aforesaid Alfred often fell into such great misery that sometimes none of his subjects knew where he was or what had become of him. In the same year, the brother of Hingwar and Halfdena, with twenty-three ships, after much slaughter of the Christians, came from the country of Demetia, where he had wintered, and sailed to Devon, where, with twelve hundred others, he met with a miserable death, being slain while committing his misdeeds by the king's servants before the castle of Kinuit, Kinwith, into which many of the king's servants, with their followers, had fled for safety. Note. The brother of Hingwar and Halfdena, probably the sanguinary Iluba. Demetia, or South Wales. End of note. The pagans, seeing that the castle was altogether unprepared and unfortified, except that it had walls in our own fashion, determined not to assault it, because it was impregnable and secure on all sides, except on the eastern, as we ourselves have seen. But they began to blockade it, thinking that those who were inside would soon surrender, either from famine or want of water, for the castle had no spring near it. But the result did not fall out as they expected, for the Christians, before they began to suffer from want, inspired by heaven, judging it much better to gain victory or death, attacked the pagans suddenly in the morning, and from the first cut them down in great numbers, slaying also their king, so that few escaped to their ships. And there they gained a very large booty, amongst other things the standard called Raven 
for they say that the three sisters of Hingwar and Hubba, daughters of Lodebrock, wove that flag and got it ready in one day. They say, moreover, that in every battle, wherever that flag went before them, if they were to gain the victory, a live crow would appear, flying on the middle of the flag. But if they were doomed to be defeated, it would hang down motionless. And this was often proved to be so. The same year after Easter, King Alfred, with a few followers, made for himself a stronghold in a place called Athelney, and from thence sallied with his vassals and the nobles of Somersetshire to make frequent assaults upon the pagans. Also, in the seventh week after Easter, he rode to the Stone of Egbert, which is in the eastern part of the wood which is called Selwood, which means in Latin Silva Magna, the great wood, but in British Coit Mor. Note. Stone of Egbert, now called Brixton Deverill, in Wiltshire. Selwood, Selwood Forest, extended from Frome to Borham, and was probably much larger at one time. End of note. Here he was met by all the neighboring folk of Somersetshire and Wiltshire and Hampshire, who had not, for fear of the pagans, fled beyond the sea. And when they saw the king alive after such great tribulation, they received him as he deserved, with joy and acclamations, and encamped there for one night. When the following day dawned, the king struck his camp and went to Oakley, where he encamped for one night. Note. Or Igley, supposed to be lay, now Westbury, Wiltshire. End of note. The next morning he removed to Eddington, and there fought bravely and perseveringly against all the army of the pagans, whom, with divine help, he defeated with great slaughter, and pursued them flying to their fortification. Immediately he slew all the men, and carried off all the booty that he could find without the fortress, which he immediately laid siege to with all his army. And when he had been there fourteen days, the pagans, driven by famine, cold, fear, and last of all by despair, asked for peace, on the condition that they should give the king as many hostages as he pleased, but should receive none of him in return, in which form they had never before made a treaty with any one. The king, hearing that, took pity upon them, and received such hostages as he chose after which the pagans swore, moreover, that they would immediately leave the kingdom, and their king Gothrun promised to embrace Christianity and receive baptism at King Alfred's hands. All of which articles he and his men fulfilled as they had promised. For after seven weeks Gothrun, king of the pagans, with thirty men chosen from the army, came to Alfred at a place called Aller, near Athelney, and there King Alfred, receiving him as his son by adoption, raised him up from the holy laver of baptism on the eighth day at a royal villa named Wedmore, where the holy chrism was poured upon him. Note. Wedmore is four miles and three-quarters from Axbridge in Somersetshire. In the Saxon Chronicle, A.D. 878, it is said that Gothron was baptized at Aller, and his chrism loosing was at Wedmore. The chrismal was a white linen cloth put on the head at the administration of baptism, which was taken off at the expiration of eight days. End of note. After his baptism he remained twelve nights with the king, who, with all his nobles, gave him many fine houses. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 879, which was the thirty-first of King Alfred, the aforesaid army of pagans, leaving Chippenham, as they had promised, went to Chirinchester, which is called in British Caer Cori, and is situate in the southern part of the Wicae, and there they remained one year. Note. 
Wickee, inhabitants of Gloucester, Worcester, and part of Warwickshire. End of note. In the same year, a large army of pagans sailed from foreign parts into the river Thames and joined the army which was already in the country. They wintered at Fulham, near the river Thames. In the same year, an eclipse of the sun took place between three o'clock and the evening, but nearer to three o'clock. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 880, which was the thirty-second of King Alfred, the above-named army of pagans left Chirinchester and went among the East Angles, where they divided out the country and began to settle. The same year, the army of pagans which had wintered at Fulham left the island of Britain and sailed over the sea to the eastern part of France, where they remained a year at a place called Ghent. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 881, which was the thirty-third of King Alfred's life, the aforesaid army went higher up into France, and the French fought against them, and after the battle the pagans obtained horses and became an army of cavalry. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 882, the thirty-fourth of King Alfred's life, the above-named army steered their ships up into France by a river called the Meuse, Meuse, and there wintered one year. In the same year, Alfred, king of the Anglo-Saxons, fought a battle by sea against the pagan fleet, of which he captured two ships, having slain all who were on board, and the two commanders of two other ships, with all their crews, distressed by the battle and the wounds which they had received, laid down their arms and submitted to the king. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 883, which was the thirty-fifth of King Alfred's life, the aforesaid army went up the river called Scald, Schelt, to a convent of nuns called Kundoch, Konde, and there remained a year. In the year of our Lord's Incarnation 884, which was the thirty-sixth of King Alfred's life, the aforesaid army divided into two parts. One body of them went into East France, and the other, coming to Britain, entered Kent, where they besieged a city called in Saxon Rochester, and situated on the eastern bank of the river Medway. Before the gate of the town the pagans suddenly erected a strong fortress, but yet they were unable to take the city, because the citizens defended themselves bravely until King Alfred came up to help them with a large army. Then the pagans abandoned their fortress, and all their horses which they had brought with them out of France, and, leaving behind them in the fortress the greater part of their prisoners, on the arrival of the king, fled immediately to their ships, and the Saxons immediately seized on the prisoners and horses left by the pagans, and so the pagans, compelled by stern necessity, returned the same summer to France. In the same year, Alfred, king of the Anglo-Saxons, led his fleet, full of fighting men, out of Kent to the country of the East Angles for the sake of plunder, and, when they had arrived at the mouth of the river Stour, immediately thirteen ships of the pagans met them prepared for battle. A fierce fight ensued, and all the pagans, after a brave resistance, were slain. All the ships, with all their money, were taken. Note, for the sake of plunder. This expression paints in strong colors the unfortunate and divided state of England at this period, for it shows that the Danes had settled possession of parts of it. In fact, all traces of the heptarchy, or ancient division of the island into provinces, did not entirely disappear until some years after the Norman conquest. The River Store. Not the River Store in Kent, but the store which divides Essex from Suffolk. Lombard fixes the battle at Harwich Haven. End of note. After this, while the royal fleet were reposing, the pagans who lived in the eastern part of England assembled their ships, met the same royal fleet at sea in the mouth of the same river, and after a naval battle, 
the pagans gained the victory. End of Part 1, Section 3